Please join me in welcoming Professor Irwing Tang, adjunct faculty uh, in the creative writing department here at Austin Community College. He studied the greatest feminine history while earning his master's degree in Asian studies at UT Austin. He has written on hunger and war in Africa for the nation. And he is a co-author of When Invisible Children Sing, a true story of five street children, an idealistic young doctor, and their dangerous hope. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, come on in, Mike. <laughs> um, so global hunger is purely psychological. Of course, this is my provocative title of my presentation here. Um, we all know it's not imaginary, but it is. Uh, the problem is in our brains. Um, so what is hunger? Uh, it sounds like a sim pretty simple question, and it's a, there's a pretty simple answer to that question. Some of you have a bunch of food, and some of you have very little food in this world, right? And, you know, the people who have very little food are, uh, tend to be hungry. Um, uh, why do they have little food? Because crap happens, right? I'll call it crappens. Um, somebody, something happens, the harvest goes bad, you know, there's a flood, there's war. Stuff happens, people go hungry. It's, that is global hunger. It's very simple. It's not complicated. Um, you know, back in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, people used to say um, there are kids starving in China. Um, I'm sure that there are very few of you that remember that. Um, <laughs> but my parents would say that, but they had a bit of a twist on it. Um, they would tell me about my actual relatives who starved to death in China, um, uh, especially during the Great Leap Forward in which um, my father's uncle and aunt, who, uh, aunt and uncle rather, it was his blood aunt and her husband, who during the Great Leap Forward in the 1950s in communist China literally starved to death along with probably tens or possibly 100 million people there. And the main reason was that the dictator, Mao Zedong, didn't really care um, what was going on. Um, uh, but the, one of the points here is that there are a lot of reasons why people go hungry, um, but there's only one solution to it. Um, now, most, pe most hunger is not like that today. Uh, most hunger is not like 20th century hunger, where you had the Great Leap Forward, you had like, uh, Ethiopia in 1984, or uh, Cambodia in 1978 to 1980, those periods where people literally like starved to death. Um, this is, the hunger today is more like um, large numbers of people who have a period of the year in which they don't have enough food. And most of these people are small farmers or farm workers. Um, you know, they have a plot of land, they plant crops. Sometimes it's really good, sometimes it's really bad. Um, the whole family works on the farm. Um, now, if you put it together, a bunch of seasons of uh, undernourishment or hunger, and you can end up with long-term undernourishment where the kids aren't growing properly, or their brains aren't developing properly, and so forth. Um, uh, typical hunger today has to do with child refugees or refugees of war or some sort of crisis, natural disaster. Um, and things like this. Um, most of the people who die of hunger today don't starve to death, Not like my uncle, my great uncle and great aunt. Um, they uh, have a lack of nutrition. They're not getting enough vitamins. Their, their immune systems are struggling. Um, they're not getting enough protein. Uh, and so that weakens them so when they get malaria or parasites, uh, influenza for instance, or possibly even a common cold, um, you know, they can't fight it off and they die. One of my aunts, along with several of my uh, aunts and uncles, died this way. Um, during World War II, there was not much medicine, not enough food, you know, they got sick. And there was one case, there was one situation in which my father and his sister, Fei Fei, 
got malaria, and my uh, grandfather was only able to secure one vial of um, a, a malaria medica uh, medication. I can't, it, I can't remember what it was called, but it's, it's a real common thing that you put in vodka now. Um, so uh, they gave it to my father, and my aunt died. Um, here's a picture of how international food aid or medical aid looks like today. It's very successful. The aid organizations, the development organizations have done a great job in trying to reach as many people as possible. This is what um, it would look like if my father had, you know, had gotten food aid during World War II, but um, there was essentially no such type of aid at that time uh, in a place like China. Um, so World Food Pro Program is very successful at it. Um, that is distributing food to people who need it. Uh, the least reachable people today are people who are purposefully starved as an act of war. And this happened in Syria um, over the past few years. Um, this was in the city of Madaya. Um, uh, the, the, the good thing is, is this doesn't happen as much as it used to. And in fact, the World Food Program was able to get into Madaya um, not that long after this photograph was taken. Um, uh, how do we abolish hunger? Like I said, a lot of different causes. It's, um, there's a really simple answer to it. Um, can anyone guess what it might be? And, it, and I don't want you to guess because I already said so. What? <laughs> Did someone say something? Better food distribution? Yes. Yes. You give food to the people who need food. Okay? People want to make it really complicated. They, some people want to make it complicated, and some people can't help but think it's very complicated. But it's very simple. You give food to people who need it. You could give money to people who need it. Um, that's been suggested, that's been done sometimes. You can give food stamps. This has been suggested by lots of researchers, um, sort of international food stamps that can be turned in at all sorts of, you know, like refugee camps and whatnot. Um, sell food at a price that the people who need the food can afford. Um, but the idea I'm trying to get to is give people food right now. Don't wait until the long-term solution comes around, or the revolution, or you know, um, whatever magical thing that's supposed to happen. Don't wait for that. We can't wait. For, people can't wait for that. I mean, you can starve to death in a couple of months, or a month. Um, the idea of food distribution, like my friend said here, um, is has worked tremendously. It's worked basically everywhere in the world. Some places better than others, of course. I mean, I mean, I have Africa on the list here. Of, of course, you know, most of these places, hunger has not been abolished. But the idea of giving food to people who need it has tremendously reduced hunger. Um, in the United States, this is how we do it, too. We spend about $70 billion a year on the food stamp program. Um, and as a result, there's very little, like, sort of third world type hunger in the United States. Um, world Food Grant Program, whoops, that's the, that's the organization that I'm really in support of. Um, they're very efficient at uh, giving food to people who, to feed people who need it. Um, these days they work, most of, uh, most of the, a lot of their work is in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia, um, but they do work in 80 nations. Um, and do y'all want to participate in an experiment? Sure. Okay, so the experiment is, uh, I gave y'all all a sheet of paper, <laughs> uh, and, what I'm, and you can, if you want to, um, get your phone out, phones out and go to the App Store and click on the, look for the Share the Meal app. Um, and if you do end up putting this app on your phone, um, and if you do end up donating um, meals to people on the other side of the globe, or maybe this side of the globe, um, choose the team Austin Community College River Bats. So far, 
we've given 30 meals. I've given 30 meals. So, I, so, <laughs> so uh, I want to challenge UT at this, okay? So I'm going to go to UT next, and, you know, I want to see who, who, can, who can win. All right. Can we do it? Can we really abolish hunger? Does, does anybody have any, any thoughts on this? Can we? Uh, the lady in the back says that she does not think so. All right. <laughs> um, well, there's a rap song from the 1990s, Biggie Smalls. He said, things done changed. Um, but in this case, it's changed in a good way. Um, now, 20th century, okay, close your eyes if you don't want to see anything disturbing. The 20th century was hell on earth, okay? I, I, I had trouble even, like, making the full list of genocides that occurred in the 20th century. You know, this, it started off with the Philippines, the American invasion of the Philippines, and you go on to World War IIs, um, you got Europe, China, Korea, all, um, just tens of millions of people dead, uh, genocides in Europe, um, the, the, the Holocaust, um, genocide and wars in Vietnam, Southeast Asia, you know, Cambodia, Laos, uh, you know, again, the Philippines, Indonesia, um, you know, kids who got uh, hit with Agent Orange and then their children suffering because of Agent Orange. So you could just, when you, when you think about it, um, you know, multiple wars in some nations, like not one, but more than one war in some nations in Africa, you know, they had to free themselves from the Europeans first, and then there were civil wars that had to do with politics. Um, the the uh, Cold War politics where the United States and Soviet Union set nations against each other and just tens of millions of people dead. Central American genocides, so on and so forth, and on and on and on. But in that same century and in this one, some of these nations that were completely destroyed, like Japan, South Korea, nations in Europe, um, nations in Eastern Europe, um, uh, the United States, who went through, which went through, not, not as bad. I mean, there was no major war in the United States, but they went through the Great Depression. A lot of these places, they complete lim completely eliminated hunger. Um, and the overall kilocalorie deficit was cut in half since 1992. Um, and then in the 21st century, if you look at this map, how many countries are red? I, I can't see any, but there might be one on there. Uh, there are some places, the gray areas, which uh, in where in uh, the country, they don't have enough information, and that probably means that there's so much calamity going on. And so some of those places have probably gotten worse, but in most of these places, there's been like in the green places, a 50% decrease just in this century in the uh, prevalence of hunger in these places. Um, you know, basically, just, just the East Asian nations probably took off some hundreds of millions of people off of the hunger list. Um, and then South America has essentially become a place, South America, Central America, and, and Mexico has essentially become a place with very low levels of extreme hunger. Um, Brazil has done a fantastic job now. They are, Brazil has, is at the same level as Japan, okay, Latin America, Vietnam, uh, South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, some of these places in Sub-Saharan Africa, they're growing very quickly economically, and they're able now to implement social programs, um, and, well, just the growing economy is making people um, be able to afford a lot more food. Um, let's see. Uh, more food, fewer wars, better tech. I'm talking about, you know, the cell phone. It's probably one of the greatest inventions for poor people around the world ever um, because now people can find other people. They can communicate people in rural third world areas. Um, new roads, the same landmass in the world, right? But millions and millions of, of, of new paved roads have been built throughout uh, Africa and Asia and Latin America. Um, uh, there's a, does anybody watch the 90 Days uh, Fiancé? It's this show where, like, Americans get engaged to, like, a, a person in a foreign country without really knowing them, and they go to the other country, and they go visit them and stuff, and then they have to bring the, their fiancé back to the United States eventually and get married. Um, so you go, so you, you watch this show, and, like, these people are going to, like, 
like one man went to the Amazon in Brazil, and the woman that he, he was wanting, that he fell in love with had a cell phone. That's how, that's how they knew each other, through the cell phone. Um, so things are changing, okay? Um, the technology, the agriculture, agricultural technology, some of y'all might not be completely for the Green Revolution, some of you are, but it's provided a huge, huge amount of food for um, people throughout the world, science of seeds. Um, breeds, irrigation, food preservation, storage, refrigeration, all of these things, plus the surplus of wealth in the world has increased thousands over the past couple of decades. Um, social status of women has improved their education as well as the edu general education of people in the third world. More education and higher status for women means greater wealth and food, better food, better nutrition for the children who are generally the victims of hunger. Most of the victims of hunger, of hunger are children. Um, again, you know, more stats. Uh, Angola, Mali, Vietnam uh, slashed their undernourishment by 75%. Um, the proportion of the world living in extreme poverty is that red line. The proportion of the world not living in extreme poverty is the green line. Um, so you can see that there's billions, literally billions of more people who could, if they wanted to, essentially abolish hunger for the shrinking, quickly shrinking number of extremely poor people, which is defined by um, people who earn a dollar a day in, I think, 1990 dollars. Um, the population of the world is start, is, will decline in 2070 peaking at 9.4 billion. Um, the birth rate is already below replacement in most industrialized nations. The only reason why our nation grows is because we have immigrants, which is cool, that's good. Um, <laughs> and uh, so the population, is, the, the, the population will peak, meaning that it's gonna, be, it's gonna become easier and easier for hunger to be abolished. Um, now, the latest research indicates that just $11 million can abolish hunger completely. It'd be invested in food, in nutrition programs, teaching mothers and families about better nutrition and better rural infrastructure, for instance, building better roads so that small farmers can get their food to the market faster and easier, because that's part of the big problem. Um, I think someone in the audience men mentioned food waste. Um, so yeah, one of the big problems is that these small farmers grow a whole bunch of food they're not gonna eat it all. They need to sell some of it to you know, have money so they can buy stuff for the rest of the year, um, but they can't sell it unless they have some vehicle to bring the food to market. $11 billion is what? It's the annual revenues of your favorite company, Coors. Um, I say that ironically. Uh, so it's, it's about how much people spend on Coors beer every year. Um, so, yep, this is the details of how it would be done. In fact, the $11 million, they're not even counting on us for that because, they, because the world has given up on us, the private citizen. They're saying something like $4 billion, no, $7 billion comes from the poor governments themselves. $4 billion, $4 additional billion dollars comes from donor nations like the U.S. government or, say, the Japanese government. Um, that, would, that represents about a 45% increase from the current donation. And they're saying that this would um, result in private citizens donating an additional $5 billion, um, which they're not even counting to, to abolish uh, world hunger with. What's going on? Like, who are the worst people in the world, right? They're lawyers and politicians, but they're the ones who are leading the charge on global hunger, right? It's the U.S. government, you know, the, the greatest military power in the world. Um, so I am challenging y'all to be better than um, our politicians. Um, who could abolish the global hunger without sacrifice? Well, the Pope could. Um, the, the Catholic Church has trillions of dollars of wealth. Uh, any one of the wealthiest billionaires, uh, there's a whole dozens and dozens of them could. Uh, any of the Christian denominations, large Christian denominations, uh, 
Christians or Muslims taken together, the Muslims are a smaller group, a poorer group, but if you took them all together, they could abolish hunger easily without sacrifice. Amazon or Apple, the new trillion dollar companies, they have a trillion dollars in value, stock market value. With just 1% of their uh, market cap, they could abolish hunger each year. Um, billions or mil billionaires or millionaires as a group, um, it's couch cushion change for them. Um, the US president, not so easily because he needs political support, uh, he needs congressional support, and he needs our support to do that. So don't count on the government. Uh, regular people like us, there's at least a billion upper middle class people in the world, right? That means people who are probably making, you know, like, you know, like $100 a day. Um, we, could, we could do it easily, right? $11 a year, we could do that. That's about three lattes. Um, so we could, we could do it. Any number of the people that we, I mentioned could do it. It, it, it could end in a week. Um, because that's about as long as it takes for food or information to reach any place in the world. Um, what would it look like? It would kind of look like this. <laughs> you know, you got a World Food Program truck going through a muddy road um, to some remote place, right, with food. Um, and, uh, and they'd probably try to make the road better with that $11 billion. Uh, it's a really simple solution. Hunger is a, really, is a simple problem to solve because when you give food to people who need food, they eat it. It's not a big, there's no, it's not complicated. It's not, it's not like, um, it's not like AIDS, you know, you're not trying to change people's behavior. You're not trying to get people to wear a condom, for God's sakes, you know. It, this, it's pretty easy. Um, there are all sorts of things that are really hard to do because you have to change people's behavior. Hunger is easy. Um, when you add a dollar to the food bank system or just the food for the hungry, it multiplies. It multiplies the wealth because people are able to become productive and therefore you're basically multiplying the wealth by like 10, 20, 30 times. Uh, these are some of the returns that you can get in, in an economy through the reduction of hunger. Every dollar invested, you could be getting up to $81 in return in the economy. There, all these studies, 23, $138 in return. I'm not gonna go through all this stuff. Um, you get the idea. You know, in places like uh, the Congo, they've seen in Indonesia, Bangladesh, they've seen the wealth multiply every time they invest in people who need food. More food means greater productivity and possibly more jobs, even in the for the people in the United States. You know, the, the countries that we saw earlier that improved their, uh, their, their lives, um, so rapidly, they're wealthier now, and they buy stuff from us, and they need new technology that we produce here in the United States. Um, so in the first 10 seconds of abolishing hunger, what would it look like? It, one kid would survive, right? Because every 10 seconds, some child dies of hunger. So every 10 seconds, there'd be a new child surviving as a result of the abolishment of hunger. Um, World Food Program and other places They've changed their tactics. Used to be they bought food from the United States and shipped it overseas. Now they're buying food from poor farmers in poor nations to give to other poor farmers in poor nations, thereby supporting the agricultural sector in places like, say, Ethiopia or Somalia. Um, here's a Yemeni refugee, war refugee. Um, a lot of refugees and other children are stunted because they're not eating properly. Here's a bunch of Indian or South Asian children eating what looks like um, beans, which is really important because beans uh, have uh, protein. You know, you can't just survive on rice, right? Um, you know, I have some relatives who, who ate mostly rice, and yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not good. <laughs> um, so immediately you would see birth rates slow down, you would see um, population growth slow down, biodiversity flourishes because, you know, there are fewer people on the earth, um, endangered species are less endangered. The Pacific plastic continent would start to shrink, or maybe it just grows slower, probably. Um, we drink less plastic. Uh, fewer child soldiers are being recruited um, from the hungry. And fewer terrorists. Then why haven't we abolished hunger? Anybody? Does anybody have any ideas? No. Well, hunger is a fundraising issue, is my conclusion, right? We, can, we know how to abolish hunger. We have 
you know, thousands of times or maybe hundreds of times more money than necessary to abolish hunger, right? So main, we're actually maintaining a state of hunger in the world because of the way we think about it. Um, all right, this is not a trick question, okay? This is not a trap, okay? Um, how many of you believe that children should not die of hunger? All right. <laughs> One person doesn't won't dignify that question. <laughs> then why is there still human hunger on this planet? Um, and that, that's, that's one answer is because we don't act on our beliefs. We react on our beliefs. Okay? I'm a, I'm a professional counselor. I, I don't know if they, they said that up front. I, I am a psychotherapist. So I see this every day in my practice. You know, people don't proactively do what they believe in. They react, and, and, and they see, and they want to make sure that their reaction kind of fits in to um, their, uh, into their beliefs. Hmm, there seems to be a picture missing here. Um, so there was a picture of a uh, drowning girl, a gif that I had here. Um, Oh, ooh, that's spooky. <laughs> All right, so what do you do? Okay, there's a girl drowning, you know, in a pool, in a lake or something in front of you. What do you do? You? She's a little more than drowning. Yeah, well, this is the picture that I saw, that I found on the internet, right? You're going to jump in and, and pull her out? Mike? Okay. You have... If you think if you think that it's it's dangerous, right, yeah, to yeah, to do so it. Some level of dangerous you're likely to accept, but beyond that, then, like, yeah. Exactly. Unless you have an emotional attachment. To it. Right. right. Unless you have an emotional attachment, you're going to weigh the danger versus whether you know. Exactly. We're more likely to just react, you know, um, than to uh, sometimes than it is to do something that we 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 really think we should do. Um, so, what if it costs three dollars and fifty cents to throw this girl a life jacket? You, you don't have to go to the pool side or to the the lake side or to the ocean side and do this. There's a delivery system. It costs $3.50 where they will launch this uh, life jacket into the water next to her, and she's going to grab it. She'll do whatever it takes to, to rescue herself, right? So um, then, then what do you do? You figure somebody else is going to pay. <laughs> <laughs> He, he's, <laughs> he said, he said, he said um, you figure someone else is going gonna, is gonna to do it, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's kind of what, what happens. Um, uh, I thought everybody was going to say, yeah, I, I pay the $3.50. Um, but, um, but, yeah, that, that tends to be what happens is, there's, there's, you know, when I tell you, like, there's three million children at risk of dying as a result of undernourishment, they might die of diarrhea, malaria, small infections. You can push a few buttons on your phone to provide proper nutrition for three dollars and fifty cents. What level of urgency do you feel on a scale of one to ten? Anybody? Ten. You feel ten. Yes. Oh wow. Okay. I usually do that right now. Okay. All right. Five, then I get distracted with my kids in some way and I forget. Okay, so we had a 10, high level feeling of urgency, and we have a five because you, you get distracted by your kids. Environment. By the environment, by the phone. Yeah, there's, no, the, no not by the phone. Okay, there's some very an honest answers here. Yeah. Um, so, so this is part of the problem. Like, yeah, people are really good when they're forced to react, or they hear about something, 
and they have an immediate emotion. I mean, is it partly the scale of, the, of people, what people think the scale of the problem is? I mean, it's fine if you, you say, well, I can save these 10 people from, from starvation by donating all their money, but then there's millions of kids out there and it kind of becomes overwhelming almost. It's like, well, I can't do very much on my own. So, 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 so. Yes, yes, it, the, and Mike was saying, that, yeah, there, it's the scale of the problem that overwhelms people, and that is part of the rationalization of the problem. We, we, we rationalize the question away. Rationalizations are basically excuses um, for yourself, right? And um, I get to hear rationalizations every day at work because I'm a counselor, because people come in with problems and bad habits, and they want me to help them, and the, one of the first things I do is ask them what are their rational, what excuses are they giving themselves? And it's a whole, you, I mean, it's, it's amazing, the, the, the diversity of it. So um, I think it's beyond, the, it, it, for me at least, it encompasses the scale of the problem, but also the breadth of the problems that I encounter. Like, I have, I don't know how many different things that are asking me to throw money at them to solve their problems. Planned Parenthood wants my money, and Beto's campaign wants my money, and you know, just a million different things in the world want my money, and I can't give money to everything. So I give money to, say, you know, the Texas Tribune because I think you know, independent journalism needs money, and I give money to this thing because I think they deserve money. But I give my time to the food bank because I can work at the food bank, and I give my time to the campaign because I can go knocking on doors. But I can't give money to everything. Right. <laughs> it's, it's scale, that, but it's also the breadth of things that I need to feel like I have to give to, and I can't give money to everything, even if it's only $3. Yeah, the, the, the depth and breadth of how, you know, how, we, how big we imagine the problem is is, um, is, is indeed uh, part of the, the sort of mental it's aspect of this. It's, it's your justification, yes, yes. Because <laughs> from the perspective of, right, of that, that kid in the refugee camp, he's like, what? Like, what That's are you waiting for? Do something for hunger here at home. <laughs> That's my justification. Okay, so the first rational, so I have nine of them. The first rationalization is there is no moral or religious imperative to actively help people. And this is the place where I'm going to get very controversial with you, right? So I hope nobody um, gets angry at me personally. Um, when I first started studying this, this question, when I, I've, been, I've been studying hunger for many years. I went to college with Kelly here, and she can tell you that we, um, you know, we, we raised hundreds or possibly even thousands of dollars for UNICEF to, to battle hunger in the third world. Um, and um, at some point uh, a few years ago, I was like, but why, why is this still going on? I mean, there's so much wealth in the world. Um, and I started reading the Bible. All right, so this is where, this is, so my stud, this is where my studies came in. Um, and it's interesting because Jesus, I read all four Gospels, right? Um, and maybe more than one time, too, right? Um, you know, I, I underlined and circled all sorts of things. But I realize there's only one specific sin that Jesus talks about as sending you to hell. He does it quite colorfully, too. Um, and that's withholding help to those in need. Um, and he does it three times, right? The first time is, is the, the story of the sheep, and, uh, the, the sheep and the goats, where he basically says, um, uh, yeah, when I'm going to come back to earth, right, uh, at some point, and I'm going to divide y'all into sheep and the goats, and the sheep are the ones who are going to be like, you know, I'm going to say, you know, I, when I was hungry, you gave me food and so forth. And they're going to like, you know, well, what, what? We didn't give you food. I don't remember giving you food, oh Lord. And he's going to say to the sheep, like, well, whatever you give to the least of mine, you, you give to me, right? Now, here's the part that people never quote because it's terrifying. And, and there was a, a famous Christian writer even admitted to me that it, was, it is terrifying. And then he's going to turn to the goats and he says, you goats, you go to hell, um, because when I was hungry, you didn't, you didn't feed me. When I, was, when I was naked, you didn't put clothes on me. Um, when I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in, and so forth. 
and the goats are going to call him Lord because apparently they're believers. And they're going to say, what do you mean? I never saw you hungry. I never saw you naked. And he's going to say to them, like, yeah, whatever you didn't do for the least of these, um, you didn't do for me. And then he's, and he says, he literally says this. Jesus says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Whew. <laughs> when I read that, I was like, I think I'm going to become a Christian. Like, literally, I thought, I might become a Christian. Um, <laughs> uh, now, how do you rationalize this away? People can rationalize anything away. And one pastor told me, because I read his article in, uh, I think it was Christianity Today, and I called him up and I was like, what do you mean we shouldn't take the sheep and the goats seriously? And uh, that, that's basically what he was saying. Like, you, you, he was saying basically, you shouldn't take this literally, right? And he says, well, I, you know, my congregation gets all worked up about it. They're like, do I have to give a dollar to every beggar I see on the street? And he's like, no, no, don't. Don't, don't go to extremes. You don't have to do that. And I was like, well, well, well what if you're wrong, pastor? And he was like, well, you know, I might be wrong. I, I could be wrong. And I'm, I'm like, well, aren't you worried about that? And he's like, well, you know, I'm doing what I can. I give a lot to charity. I'm like, well, what are you telling your, your congregation, though? <laughs> so, I mean, he's covering his own butt, right? Um, so uh, apparently both the sheep and the goats are believers. That's the most terrifying part of it um, for Christians. Um, Isn't it, I mean, the, doesn't the sort of the doctrine of salvation sort of trump that? I mean, essentially you can be sinful. If you're saved, then you can be sinful in not giving, not following. I asked, doc, doesn't the doctrine of salvation cover that? I asked Dr. Ron Sider about that. And he's, he's the, he, he wrote a book called Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. It's a very f famous book amongst, uh, I guess, evangelicals. Um, and he said, no, not necessarily. It's a, this is a very terrifying passage of, of the Bible, um, and this is what Jesus says. Um, and he says, you know, I, I, went to, I traveled to Pennsylvania to talk to him about this. That's how important I thought it was. I went to his home. He lives in a little duplex in a Mennonite community and he sits on a very dirty, not dirty, I'd say sort of a dilapidated rocker. Um, uh, and, um, and he gives basically all of his money away to, to uh, people in need. Um, and that's how he lives. Because um, he's told, sold probably a million books. Um, and uh, he said, you know, look at things like Lazarus and the rich man, you know. The rich man didn't give Lazarus food Lazarus just wanted a few crumbs, and so the rich man ends up going to hell and begging Lazarus to bring him some water, but Lazarus can't cross the chasm. And this was a story that Jesus tells, right, to warn people about what happens, you know, when you withhold things from the needy. And finally, of course, the third one is, I tell you the truth again, <laughs> he says. And he tells, you know, he says basically, as you know, you know, a rich man has... Um, has as much chance of going into the kingdom of God as a camel going through the eye of a needle. Okay, we all know about that one. Um, and there's all sorts of rationalizations for all these things. You know, uh, well, I'm, I'm not ri rich. Um, well, uh, you might be rich compared to what Jesus thought was rich. Um, the, the camel's a symbol. Uh, doesn't, yeah, it's a symbol representing what can't get through an eye of a needle. That's what it is. Um, and people say, of course, John overrides Jesus. But then I'm like, well, isn't Jesus the boss of John? Like, <laughs> we're not talking about John the Baptist. We're talking about John the writer, right? Um, and doesn't Jesus override what John writes on, in 316? Lots of rationalizations. We all need them to survive, and we all need to, them to get along, get through our day. Um, I'm not going to go through all this stuff, but obviously the Christians are not alone. The Muslims, the Buddhists, the Hindus, and Jews are all called to help those in need. Um, and, you know, we're talking about billions of people who have massive repetitive rationalizations going on in their brains. As it is obvious that hunger has not been eliminated amongst other things. I am powerless. I'm not rich. I can't spare the money. I, I got credit card debt. I got I to buy things. Um, this is the government's job. You know, that's, that's a common one. They're failing. The government sucks. 
Giving money doesn't help, it helps. $11 billion help would abolish hunger. The billions of dollars that have gone into hunger relief and economic development has helped a lot. It's saved millions and millions of people's lives. I mean, people don't want to, people always say aid doesn't help, but there's a reason why we got from, you know, the, we had all those green countries on that, on that map. And it wasn't just because of aid, of course. I mean, economic growth is probably the, uh, the chief factor in getting people permanently out of hunger. Uh, the government steal all the money and the aid organizations make money. All right, well, the government, uh, yeah, the US government might give money to like governments that we don't like, that, that we find unseemly. Um, that's true, but private citizens don't have to give money to those governments. When we give money to Oxfam or you know, World Vision or the World Food Program, we're not giving them to governments, we're giving them to private, non-governmental organizations that circumvent, get around these nasty, corrupt governments and go directly to the people, right? Um, teach a man to fish, yes, the aid organizations are giving people food, but they're also teaching people better agricultural methods, um, nutritional education, like, you know, teaching women that ha they, they have to breastfeed their children for, you know, months or over a year, uh, ed increase, improving education, especially for girls, um, building better food preservation, transport. Um, so this rationalization basically comes down to, if I cannot teach a man to fish, I will refuse to give him a fish and then I will watch him die from privation. I'm sorry about being so heavy-handed. <laughs> but but this, this, this particular rationalization just gets to me. It gets to me. It, uh, especially because the people that we, that we are saying, you have to teach that man how to fish. That man was already learning how to fish. That man already knows how to fish. He's been farming that land for generations probably. You know, and yeah, maybe he could use some advice or something like that, but he's constantly trying to improve his life as it is. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, this, the image of the helpless African or Asian or uh, Latino is uh, completely false in my mind. <laughs> they're, prob they're working harder at improving their own situation, probably working harder than I will ever work a single day in my life. Rationalization number six, there will be too many people. If we feed people, if we give food to those hungry children, to the children that lacks vitamin A or protein, they're gonna have more children. And there's too many people on earth already. This is what I call the Thanos rationalization. Not suffering, salvation. That's what Thanos said. Um, you know, did y'all watch the movie? Basically, he wants to kill half the people in the universe in order to prevent overpopulation. Um, the reality is when you help, okay, so what happens when this woman understands that some proportion of her children will die of, of undernourishment or some simple disease that's easily cured in the West? Well, she will have more children in order to make sure that some of them will survive. My grandmother had 10 children through, like this was during World War II and the Communist Revolution in China. Like, there, was, there were bombs dropping nearby, there were people being shot, um, and she, just wanted to have more. She decided, her and my grandfather decided to have more and more children. Um, three of them died. Um, one of them was, was a half, uh, half daughter. Um, uh, but the, the next generation, I, she, of those 10 children, I think there were 10 grandchildren total. So the, the, rate, the birth rate completely slowed down because her children went to graduate school and you know, they're, they're middle class citizens and so forth. Um, they don't have to worry about the children dying. So, one point, you said earlier on that it immediately slows, you don't say here. And I think, I'm not sure that's true because I think there's 
there is some lag between the improved health of the parents and then sort of better family planning, which comes after that. So there's usually a spike in the birth rate. At least survive, survive, you know, sort of population growth goes up. There's a spike in the population, right, because more people are surviving, right? So there's a temporary spike in the population before the birth rate slows and, you know, the death rate, uh, the death rate and the birth rate slow down. And, um, Were your grandparents yeah. uh, farmers? My grandmother was a school teacher, and my grandfather was a, a, gen, a general or a military officer. Um, so the rationalization number seven is let's talk about something else. And I'm not going to go into it because it's a pure distraction. Let's argue about something else like GMOs or something like that. Okay, like recent, recently, uh, AMD, supermarket of the world, and the environmentalists of the world had an argument about GMO farming in the third world. And it was a big distraction because they used, they used world hunger as a political football. Like, we're not going to be able to solve global hunger unless we have GMOs or, you know, uh, or unless we don't have GMOs. But none of those groups were saying, uh, we need to just give the food that we have available right now to the people who have, who have needs for it. Um, and so it just became a big distraction to the real problem, which is just take the food that you have right now and give it to people who don't have food. Um, corollary to number seven, what, what was this? We can, do, ah, we can do nothing unless we address the root issues. Uh, and this, is, this is also like a big a, a big uh, bog, a big swamp to get into, because the root issues are like war, uh, corruption, um, climate change. You know, this is going to take decades or hundreds of years to solve these problems. So, no, the first thing you do is you give people food. Um, number eight, charity starts at home. Americans come first. We must end hunger in a nation first. No, we don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't equate, I don't value Americans more than any other group of people. Like that, that kid in Yemen or in northern Nigeria that's struggling right now, that, that kid is just as important as any kid in the United States. Um, and frankly, the type of hunger that exists here, the type of undernourishment that, that, that's here, um, is very different from the undernourishment in the, in the third world. Um, number nine is... Those Africans slash Asians will never get there. Like, oh my God, there they go again. <sighs> you know, you know, you know what? What do you see missing here? Latinos. I was gonna say that. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 like uh, Latin America, uh, South America, you know, especially has has in Mexico has made tr huge strides in in. Uh, solving their, their hunger issues. Um, so uh, this is kind of a sort of an unconscious or some kind of sort of nationalist or sort of racist, ethnocentric sort of belief. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't necessarily say it out loud. Most people won't say it out loud, but, but it's back there, right? Ah, oh, oh, those, those countries, you know. But the truth is that with the end of all these wars, I mean, in Latin America, you had wars in almost every nation, in the 20th century, bad wars, like horrible wars. Um, and with the end of wars in Africa and Asia and Latin America, these countries are able to, to rise up and improve their economies. And some of the, these economies in Africa are some of the fastest growing economies in the world. The China-Africa relationship is gonna end up being historic, when you look back in history, it's gonna be one of the most important economic relationships in history. Um, because the trade there is making, making those countries wealthier and wealthier. Um, concentric circles, <sighs> people thinking, like, my inner circle is me and my family, right? Okay, they're always going to be more important than anybody else, right? You're excused for that. You, you know, I expect nothing else. No one expects anything else. But beyond that, we need to start thinking of everyone else being equal, like Americans and Mexicans, and uh, uh, Angolans, um, Bangladeshis, you know, Cambodians, um, Albanians are all equal. And we need to start 
applying that to all our institutions, you know, when we hear of like 100 Iraqis dying in a bomb blast, uh, how does that compare to when we hear about like a school being shot up in California or in Texas, let's say? I, I mean, the bomb blast in Iraq is like a fleet, a fleeting thought in our mind. Um, and I think that should, I, I hope that can change. How do we change people's rationalizations and get them to pitch in? One really dirty word, marketing, which means basically trying to influence people with ideas, thoughts, images, um, and so forth. Uh, when I was a kid, there was a woman named, named Sally Struthers who made these commercials. She was a famous actress, and she would go to like a poor village somewhere and um, ask for money for these poor children. Um, and it worked for a lot of people. Wow, compassion, anxiety, guilt, and shame, disgust, um, even. Um, and they identified with the famous actress, like, oh, you know, look at her, she's trying to help. You know, I want to be, I want to, I want to do that too. Um, but that can also turn people off. Like, people want to see progress. You know, she would just, these commercials would just come on, and then you see the same commercial over and over. You never saw the end of the story. Um, so in that way, people kind of felt like it was like a black hole. And that, that image has stayed with, I think, especially Americans for decades. Um, also, it makes people feel an anxious and guilt and shame. And when we feel those feelings, we want to get rid of them, right? Um, now you can go to a counselor, right, and help your, you know, make, help make yourself feel better, right? But most, of, most people are going to be like, they're going to come up with an excuse, a rationalization. And, and that, that rationalization can be as simple as, well, they shouldn't have so many children. I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't need to pay attention to this. Um, Basically, the two basic motivations to stop something negative and to improve something, make more positive, right? Um, and we need to do both. The people who, we need, to, we need to get people to think in both manners when it comes to people struggling in the developing world. Not only should, I, should you be thinking, get rid of hunger, but also, hey, we can make, the, make things better. Not only for them, but for us. Um, focus on the benefits of doing good, not just the cost of doing nothing. Um, people need a good story and an identifiable victim. That's, a, that's an actual term. I just call it a good character. Um, who's this? Anybody? <laughs> yes, The Hunger Games. Do you know how much money this movie has made? It's like, it's like in the billion dollar figure, like billion, more than a billion dollars, right? Um, so she's a great character. She's got an interesting story. We know all about her love interests and what she wants and their backstory and so on and so forth. The, the girl who just got uh, hit uh, by white, soft, white phosphorus in Syria and who hasn't eaten in a couple of days, she's not such a good story, right? We don't know her name. We don't know what she's been going through. We don't know her parents. All we know is, you know, a big, bigger story. Meanwhile, baby Jessica falls in a well. Everybody know about baby, baby, baby Jessica? No? This happened uh, years ago, I guess, maybe before some of y'all were even born. Um, this was the first big sort of, you know, well, baby Jessica story. She fell in a well, and, like, the whole nation was transfixed on this. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we couldn't stop thinking about it for weeks or even months. Um, 2008, uh, Time had this on their cover of their magazine, Ethiopia's Harvest of Hunger. Okay, millions of Ethiopians, they mentioned. The rains came late and millions are threatened. Why food alone won't save them? All right, so how does this compare to baby Jessica? There's millions of these Ethiopians, right? How, you, you, people don't identify with a million people. They identify with one little, little child. Um, there's no names, no life stories, no individual identities. And, and then the headline says, food aid alone won't save them. So, so you know, the first thing I think, millions at risk of starving, you know, let's send them some food. No, it won't help. You can't save them. Um, 
So the marketing of those people who are at risk of hunger is totally working against them. Um, please show us the end of the story, even if it's a bad ending. I think people need the end of the story. Like, what happened to that million, of pe million people in Ethiopia in 2008? What Nobody knows. Like, even if it's a bad ending, like 10,000 people died, we still need to know the end of it because otherwise we'll think it's a black hole. Lobby the media. We have to lobby the media. Um, people, someone has to lobby the media. An alligator shot to death gets more by a vengeful... Did y'all hear about this? The alligator that got shot to death by a vengeful dog owner is more newsworthy than children, you know, tens of thousands of children battling malaria or measles. Same with the bridge collapse in Italy, you know. Um, that's horrible, but so is a cholera outbreak, you know, in Yemen. Um, terrorist attack in London is always going to be 10 times covered more than a, t a, a terrorist attack in Somalia, which ends up being a two-sentence story on the radio. Um, somebody needs to take the media to task for what? You can call it racism, you can call it nationalism. Um, I'm not going to call it that, not to their faces, because I want them to change. So please, media, uh, forgive me. I'm just, I'm just asking you, take everyone as an equal, please. Um, what if the Pope, speaking of marketing, just said, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, that's, that's the sheep and the goats passage, and dropped the mic, like he just, just dropped the mic right there, and just went back into the, the, the papal palace or whatever it is, and like people would be like, what is that? What is it? What is it? That would be an awesome marketing ploy. Um, what if Hillary and Obama got 100 million Americans to act? Like, basically, I would say there's 100 million people in America who are pretty devoted to the liberal wing of the Democratic Party or semi-liberal wing. What if they said, hey, all of you people, I want you to donate $20 to abolish hunger? Or what if Donald Trump asked a few of his billionaire friends to act? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about people who have tens and hundreds of billions... Uh, like a hundred billion dollars, some of these people. They could snap their fingers and things would change in this world. Well, that type of marketing is also called leadership. So, um, and some of y'all might be in the position to act as leaders. Uh, more marketing tips, focus on successes from actions, um, focus on individual, individuals who are struggling, not giant groups because people have difficulty identifying, limit the scope of the action, like we're gonna, we're gonna uh, help the people in the village of Aleppo, Syria, right? If I told all of Austin, like, we're gonna, we're gonna send a rescue mission into Aleppo, it'd be like, whoa, this is exciting, and we can actually accomplish this, right? Because Aleppo is probably not bigger than, than Austin. Um, make helping a competition, gamify the act of helping, make it fun, create online communities. These were all suggestions that I have been putting forth for years um, and I invented a game called the Hunger Game, which didn't take off, um, where you took a picture of your meal, and, um, and coinciding with that, you would make a donation to the World Food Program, which would be would in where, so that you would be able to share your meal with someone who needed food, and also share the picture of the meal with all your friends. Well, interestingly, um, the World Food Program, along with other uh, uh, organizations, but especially the WFP, has taken a lot of this advice and actually invented an app, um, that app that, that you have a handout about. You can actually do, play the Hunger Game now through that app. Um, why does no one ask, why does, why does anyone ask, is this a racial issue? Like everything in today's world we ask, does anything, does this have to do with race? Is this a racial issue? I think it's an interesting question to ask regarding the issue of hunger and undernourishment, dirty water, malaria. Um, does our prejudice or unconscious devaluing of certain people or certain groups of people or certain classes of people, may not even be race, or certain geographies of people? Um, don't make people feel so guilty all the time. Uh, 
make it more of a social pressure thing. Does everybody remember this ice bucket challenge, like LeBron James was pouring cold water on his head and, and stuff like this? Um, that's the type of social pressure we need. Like, we need, like, especially, like, people in the first world to feel a little bit of pressure, but not that pressure. It's kind of like, you know, you want to buy a candy bar for the band? Oh, yeah, sure, here's a dollar. Yeah, was, okay. Um, everybody's, everybody's buying candy bars. Um, so make not acting look kind of bad, right? Not shameful, just like, you're a bit out of fashion, man. You, 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 didn't, you, didn't, you didn't make the Mandela commitment, the commitment to donate $30 to the developing world every year. Anyways. <laughs> um, and never say we can only succeed if. This mistake has been made by uh, aid organizations. They say, we can only succeed if we can end conflict. That was the most recent one. I'm like, don't say that. You can succeed if you can get that truckload of food to that town or to that, that uh, village. That's all you need to do. We don't have to end war. We don't have to uh, end communism or uh, overhaul capitalism. Um, show before and after pictures, do a make-a-wish this, is not a, this was not a Make-A-Wish Foundation thing. This was International Rescue, Found, a rescue Organiz, uh, Committee, rather. Somehow they got Elmo to come to a Syrian refugee camp. Um, but this, this should have been all over the news. This should have had Make-A-Wish type of publicity. You know how you see those Make-A-Wish segments on ESPN and stuff? This is the type of thing that we need to see like on ESPN or Lifetime or any of the cable networks. Final marketing tips. We need an enemy. Like, people are more likely to act, a lot of times, against something or someone than they will for something or someone. Um, that enemy could be an epidemic. It could be a drought. But we need to see it. We need to have pictures of it. We need to see it progressing or regressing. We need to see us conquering it and battling it. Um, and produce and show us the ongoing story. Make it a story, like I said. Even if it's, you know, showing a truck going from Addis Ababa into the hinterlands or Mogadishu. Um, and the aid, aid organizations need to join forces in marketing. There's probably hundreds or thousands of development and uh, relief organizations throughout the world. Some of them are in the United States, um, you know, channeling relief to other countries. Some of them are in those countries themselves and asking for donations from the first world and the developing world itself. They need to join forces and collectively create bigger marketing campaigns. Selena Gomez is a, a diplomat uh, uh, for uh, UNICEF. She's a representative of UNICEF, but we don't ever get to see her on television pitching UNICEF, you know? Why not? Why is there no Super Bowl ad? Why don't we ask the Super Bowl to donate 25 seconds to this? So, so if if these organizations can join forces and get like some really good, a really good marketing, marketing team together, they can get better celebrities, better ads, and um, better YouTube videos and so on and so forth. Um, they already do lobby as bread for the world to the US government. Um, make it about the environment. Save the humans is the best way of saving the environment. Why? Because for every American that is like, I say Americans, right? Because there's more and more Americans around the world. Like, like for instance, um, the Chinese may eventually become consume, American-type consumers, right? Um, and that would be just horrible for the environment. If everybody consumed stuff like the Americans did, there would be no world left, right? Um, so we need to slow population growth down so that there will be fewer American-type consumers in the future. Um, and so sell it to the environmentalists, because a lot of times people can identify more with a, uh, a whale than with a human. Um, can anybody think of any benefits to you that you might get in helping to abolish hunger? Helping somebody, I think just a personal satisfaction. 
Uh huh. Even if you're not doing, you know, like she said, like I can't give my money to everybody. I think just for you personally, like it just would feel nice. Feel good for your soul. Mm hmm. Be saved. <laughs> 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 okay, so, yeah, so so she said yes. Yeah, she's she's a lifelong Catholic, and um, and it's good for her soul, and uh, it is it is good for the soul, even for the the non non religious. I think it, it does fertilize the soul, and 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 finally, uh, she also said that she would like to be saved in the end. So uh, that <laughs> she is Catholic. So so that's that's useful. Uh, anyone else? Less civil unrest. Less civil unrest. Yes, that's something that I didn't uh, didn't talk about much. Um, but indeed, uh, I mean, you can look at what's happening in Venezuela right now, you know, which is not purely a political crisis. Because of the political crisis, in part, there is an economic crisis. And now because there's an economic crisis, that just makes the political crisis even worse, right? So there's more, there's, there's more violence and so forth. Um, Yes, uh, and hopefully uh, the dictators of the world, and there are far fewer dictators now, the dictators in the world can learn that um, keeping your people hungry doesn't help you. Um, so, questions and, and comments, anyone? We have a microphone here so that we can get it on ACC TV. <laughs> Come on, guys. Michael. <laughs> so if Bill Gates called you up tomorrow and said, look, I've heard your lecture. I've got a million, a billion, $11 billion to spare for the next 20 years. How close to the, I mean, you say, you basically made the claim that if that was available, then you know, world hunger would be cured. So I'm just, you know, then there's sort of all sorts of questions about logistics and where the money goes and who's there to organize it all and all that kind of stuff. I mean, surely some of that sort of goodwill will end up getting sort of lost in all that bureaucracy and, and uh, I mean, are the programs in place or is that something that has to be developed uh, so that $11 billion could... Well, okay, first of all, um, these organizations work in a lot of countries already. Their, their infrastructure is huge, right? So for instance, the World Food Program works in 80 countries. Um, so the number of countries that need to be reached is, is fewer and fewer um, over the decades. So uh, yeah, the, inf the general infrastructure is there. The ideas, the research is there already. Um, a lot of the new technologies um, are not there. Um, but they have been developed because they're new technologies out there. But the old technologies, the ones that were developed 10 years ago, um, are ready to, to be distributed, right? Um, so uh, I would say if Bill Gates had $11 billion, and he does, um, yeah, it would be tremendous because the, 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 the plan that, that I talked about took about half the money from the poor governments themselves. So the $11 billion included half, half of that money was from those developing nations governments themselves, and then half of it was from donor nations, and they didn't even count private donations, right? So if Bill Gates were to give, put in $11 billion a year, and that, that's the estimate, right? Not only would it help world, not only would it stop global hunger, but it would inspire millions of people around the world to join in, because it'd be this enormous like event, you know, and a lot of people would want to get in on it, um, which is kind of the sad thing, right? We, we want to we be part of something big, something world changing, right? If Bill Gates said, you know, I got $11 billion and if you want to put $5 in with me, we can, we can say that we, you know, abolish global hunger. I think a lot of people would be like, yeah, let's do it. Um, but because I think global hunger is seen as a sort of, sort of constant slippery slope climb, which it isn't, um, people feel like, eh, it's just, I'm not doing anything. But in actuality, uh, tremendous progress has been made. So um, 
so yeah, um, I think I think it would it would it would work. It's just I, I, I get the feeling there's probably going to be a lot of skepticism about that claim that you're making and whether that getting over that hump and I, believing it. Yeah, yeah, believing it, stuff. right? Because because we've been we've been just like cascaded with all these images, you know, of the kid with the fly flies on his forehead and so forth. And we never see the end of that. We never see like, like, you know, we went and tried to, uh, the United States tried to prevent uh, massive starvation in Somalia in 1991, 92, right? Um, and the only images that we have from that is Black Hawk Down, right? <laughs> when in actuality, um, the food organizations, the aid organizations, um, and the temporary like uh, order that was sustained for a while there did help a lot of people survive. Um, so, so yeah, I think people have been essentially brainwashed, um, <laughs> and um, I'm trying to change that. <laughs> Would y'all have? Um, what about uh, like how long would that? Eleven billion dollars uh, a year take like how many years? Uh, you're right. That's an excellent question. I had it uh, on the uh, slides, and I think it was something like um, till 2030 or something like that. So it'd be eleven billion dollars for basically the next eleven or twelve years. Um, uh, now, how does that work? Well, you know, like like I had shown when people are able to nourish themselves properly, they become a lot more productive. Um, and they also have fewer children. Um, they probably have more time to educate themselves, um, to learn new crafts and trades, maybe even to do some microfinancing. Microfinancing is blowing up in Africa right now. Like the, 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 the epicenter of the microfinance world, I think, is in Kenya. Like, these are like essentially you know, very poor people who have a cell phone, and now they're able to borrow like maybe 10, 20, 30, 50 dollars when they need it, right? Um, and the research has shown that these loans are paid back at tremendous rates. You know, um, the, the whole microfinance revolution has, has shown this. So, um, so you know, when you give, I think, people a little bit of room to work with, you give a poor farmer, a bicycle, you know, that like multiplies his, his productivity because then he can put, you know, a load of cabbage on the back of his bike and drive it to, um, you know, somewhere where they need, need cabbage. And, and so he's not going to be able to eat all that cabbage in, in a month, right? I mean, it might even go to waste. Um, so, so yeah, that's how it works. Um, it ends. Hunger can, can end. Um, the productivity of poor people can be quickly improved by some very simple um, tactics. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking about my grandfather again, you know. Um, you know, when they, when they escaped China, when the communists took over, uh, you know, he was able to, he had some savings, so he was able to uh, you know, get some place to live and get some chickens. And with those chickens, I mean, they lived off of those chickens, right? Because those chickens laid a whole slew of eggs like every, every day. And they, you know, but it took a little bit of investment, just a little bit of investment to get those chickens. Now, sadly, all those chickens died eventually and they had to find, they had to find another, you know, they, luckily, they had some savings, and they were able to, you know, invest again in some something else. But just a little bit of investment can improve the productivity of poor people tremendously. Yes. Uh, don't you think? Um, don't you think that hunger is always going to exist because war is always going to exist? So if there's war, there's going to be devastation, destruction. Then you have to spend money to rebuild roads, and you're going to have the same problem. So that's why somebody may be skeptical when they hear that it's gonna, we can end hunger if you give us money. 
because of problems like this. You know, it's always going to happen. Right. Um, well, look at Syria. Right. That, that's about as a horrible, horrible a war as one can imagine. Right. But they've been, the, the organizations like the World Food Program have been able to get food to some of the most like purposefully starved, like the Syrian government purposefully surrounded certain towns and prevented food from getting in, right? Um, and that's why you saw that picture of that kid in Madaya. Um, but even then, the World Food Program was eventually able to get trucks into that place. And if countries like the United States were more dedicated to the idea of helping people rather than solving problems militarily, if a really, really horrible situation, a, a situation worse than Madaya came about, we could, um, you know, drop food to people if we wanted to. Um, we did it with the Berlin airlift. Uh, did, uh, does that, no, no, nobody, nobody's, no one here is old enough to remember that, but <laughs> one person. Um, basically, the United States uh, uh, dropped supplies into the city of Berlin after the communists um, essentially, what's that? Is, that? is that not what happened? No, no, no. <laughs> but, but yeah, we are able to, and we've done that in different cases as well, um, when, it, when it really suited our, both of our, our humanitarian and our political needs. So yes, there, there, may, there may very well be war, um, always, but our ability to ameliorate the, the problems created by war are improving, you know, greatly. And there are fewer wars today than there were, there were when, I was, when I was young. Yeah, so, so I'm optimistic. I, I encourage y'all to be optimistic. <laughs> I, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So if, um, let's say the, the priority for us to end global hunger is, uh, as you say, to help those organizations be prepared to aid, then all the issues that we have with, say, um, supermarkets and their managing of waste of food and things like that, that, that is all secondary? Yeah, us saving food here doesn't translate to more food over there, overseas you know, um, in Haiti, for instance. It doesn't help the Haitians. Um, and if, if we all stopped eating chocolate, for instance, there'd be a lot of really disappointed chocolate farmers in Africa, right? I mean, that, that would, that's the extreme of, of that situation, right? So if you imagine, like, we stopped drinking coffee and eating chocolate, There'd be a lot of people in Latin America and in Africa and in Southeast Asia who would be like, what is wrong with you? Please buy our chocolate. <laughs> Eat lots and lots of chocolate. Um, so so, when, so that's, the, that's another rationalization, I think, is like, oh, well, you know, for Lent, I gave up, you know, cake or something like that. Well, that's great, you know, that's great to lose weight, but it doesn't necessarily, like, help Anybody? <laughs> One more question for Michael. So you're optimistic, and I'm optimistic too, but what about, is there any scope for the rise of nationalism in the States and in Europe? And Is there any scope uh, for the what? For the rise of nationalism in Europe and well, all around Europe and in, in, in the States to reverse the trends you know, towards uh, solving global hunger? I mean. Well, um, you know, we've gone through a lot of different types of administrations over the years, or over the decades, right? Both in America and in Europe um, and in Japan. Japan's now definitely a first world nation, Korea joining them. Um, and the uh, amount of aid that goes to the United Nations. Um, and to these, these relief organizations, it hasn't fluctuated that much. Um, like the Trump, the Trumps and the Obamas and the Bushes and the Clintons and so on and so forth. 
Um, you know, uh, partially because the commitment is not huge. Um, the amount of money that is, you know, used as foreign aid, first of all, it's very small. And then the portion that actually goes to helping real people is even a smaller fraction of that fraction. So, um, so that's, um, that's another reason why I think it's up to the, us private citizens, the non-governmental um, entities of the world, because the governments seem to have um, stagnated. They've reached their limit. You know, they're not like, you know, like, oh, I'm going to double aid to, you know, to, to this cause or something like that. So, um, and the other thing, too, is uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa and India and so forth, um, uh, they're becoming less uh, reliant on this aid. Um, and it's becoming more about economic relationships. So that's why I mentioned China and Africa, because Africa is basically saying, hey, look, China, <laughs> we got all these uh, resources, and you know how to do factories. Why don't you put some of those factories over here, or why don't you build a road from here to there so that we can bring the goods from you know, the, the rural areas to the port, and then you can go do something with it. Um, so uh, I think that the economies in those um, countries uh, are rising uh, up out of, out of war and out of uh, crazy ideas, like stupid ideas, like, you know, like, like say Vietnam, they got rid of state planning, state, state planned economy, which was just, I mean, that, it was just insane that they were doing that in 1990, still doing that in 1997. And after they did that, their hunger rate just plummeted. Um, just, I think it, it went down by something like 75 or 80% um, as a result of, simply as a result of saying, all right, you people, you can do whatever you want with your money. You can start businesses. You can sell stuff. We're not going to stop you. We're not going to take 20% of your crops and give them to so-and-so. Um, so, so yeah, anyways, it's going to happen, but we need to keep the, pro keep the momentum going. Keep the momentum going. Anybody have any final questions or comments? Hold on. Okay. Oh no, you're not. You're not donating to me. You're you're well, donating no, to. Know, the, but yeah. It's the Austin Foundation. Yeah. You're oh yeah. Project. Austin Community College, uh, River Bats. Yes. How many of so this is part of the experiment? How many of you put the Share the Meal app on your phone? Awesome. Wow, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>